Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm Rachel Yucatel. Okay, so I feel like you guys all probably know her name, Dita Von Tees. She is somewhat iconic. And if you're not really sure what she represents, you're going to love this show. So for a long time, I've heard her name. Um, I know her face, you know, I know her look. It's an iconic look that she's had. And it really hasn't changed. We all know that she was married to Marilyn Manson. But what do we really know about her besides the image that's in our minds of her, um, you know, laying seductively in a martini glass. So I think you're really going to like this episode because we really get to know who Dita is behind the headlines. She grew up in Orange County, California, and at an early age was heavily influenced by movies and movie stars of the 1940s. She began dressing in vintage and played around with makeup and hair color, perfecting her look. And before she gave, became the Dita we all know today as the queen of burlesque, there were lots of stops along the way. There were strip clubs, fetish photo shoots, and even her own pay website before things like Cameo or OnlyFans existed. I think most people really got to know her when she had that Betty Page haircut and started being seen on the red carpet with her then husband, Marilyn Manson. But the truth is she was always an entrepreneur. She saw a space for herself doing something no one else was doing and created a brand. Last year, Dina's iconic martini glass dance was featured in the film Don't Worry Darling with Harry Styles and in Taylor Swift's video Bejeweled, not bad company to be in. I got to talk to Dita about Taylor, the show she's currently performing in at the Jubilee Theater in Vegas, the evolution of burlesque and how she played a huge part in bringing it all back to the masses. Personally, I really had no idea about the history of burlesque or even exactly what that was before talking to her. She's such a style connoisseur. It makes me want to redo my whole wardrobe and redecorate my house. So sit back, enjoy getting to know a more personal side of Dita Von Tees. so much for joining me on Misunderstood. It's so exciting to have you here. Nice to meet you. I'm excited to be here. So I wanted to start by asking you like what it was like for you, because I know you as a child is very different from you now. So what was it like growing up? You're from Michigan and then in Orange County, right? Tell me what that was like. Yeah. Uh, well, I was born in Rochester, Michigan, and then moved to a town called West Branch, which is a very small town with like 2000 people. And then I moved with my family to Orange County, California, when I was about 12. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's like the beginnings of it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was like... Yeah, siblings, like what? what's your yes. family? Yeah. I have uh, two sisters, one older and one younger. And um, my parents were married till I was like 15, 16, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what else can I say? I don't know what's interesting and what's not... <laughs> interesting is that you know you've created such a persona now and I'm curious because I've seen pictures of you as a child you were blonde your name wasn't Dita you know so I'm just curious like what you know how you got to the to the position you're in now like were you enamored by old movies like what was it that that got you where you are well in back in Michigan my mother loved to watch old films from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So there was that. And she also was a big collector of antiques. So, um, you know, we were always like going to antique shops and things like that together. So that kind of started my love of old things and and uh, vintage movies. So I feel like, and my mother's a manicurist. So I'd watch her do people's nails in our home. And um, my father was a machinist um, often, often out of work when I was, when I was little. Um, but yeah, I, I think like just it had such a big imprint on me, these classic films. And I grew up kind of just feeling like, oh, that's what I was going to dress like, you know, when I was, I was a grown woman. And to me, that was like what I wanted to look like. And I was very, very clear in that. <laughs> right. I'm curious what your friends from high school would say about you. What were you what did they see you as? 
Yeah. Um, I, in high school, I was still blonde. Um, I did not play with my hair colors yet, but I was in high school. I was working in a lingerie store and I had like one best girlfriend and she, we both had long-term boyfriends. Her boyfriend was older and went to another school or wasn't in school anymore or something. And, um, yeah, we were kind of like this birds of a feather and I worked in this lingerie store and, uh, we already like kind of started dressing in vintage and I used to wear like little bustiers with my, my pants and, and skirts and things. So it's kind of like started like that. And of course, like anytime there was a homecoming or prom or something like that, I would really like, you know, wear, turn it out and wear vintage looks. Um, so it kind of started there. Um, and, and when I graduated from high school, I, uh, I went to my first rave party and met all these club kids and drag queens and it kind of like opened up a whole another world for me where I really started like playing with my hair and my makeup and my clothes even more. Mm -hmm. And I first started dressing in vintage because I couldn't afford like the, you know, my parents weren't, weren't buying me like designer jeans and all that kind of stuff. So um, it started with kind of like a necessity because back in the eighties and nineties, I don't, you know, vintage clothing was not the big cachet it is now. So mm -hmm. that's really where it came from. And just, um, yeah, I just always felt like I could, I, I, ga I gained a lot of confidence from dressing the way that I liked. And I felt like I could, you know, liked, um, kind of creating this, this mythological femme fatale, um, persona that kind of counteracted my shyness. Right. And is that when you finally, like, did you play with your hair? You said you were playing with your hair. Did you finally go black and you were like, this is it. I love it. This is the style. And you never went back or how did that become? It's kind of gradual. Like, um, in my like 19 to 21, I was wearing my hair still blonde, but I wore it in like a beehive hairdo and I used to put all these like like things in my hair in my beehive like jeweled uh butterflies and and rhinestone things and everything so it's kind of like doing this 60s thing with the thick black cat eye and then I kind of shifted person you know shifted eras um went from like a like a late 60s to like a 50s like you know, I dyed my hair bright red and I wore it in a, a flip and then I cut it into like a black Louise Brooks um, bob haircut right after that. And then once I went with, then I grew it long and I was very into Betty Page. So this is like, you know, I was like, all of this happened in the course of like eight, 19 to 21. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then I kind of, I started, I became very uh, interested also in the swing dance scene. It was like, in Orange County, the swing dance scene was really like bubbling up there because a lot of the, the dancers that worked at Disneyland, which like if you grew up in Orange County, you know, a lot of people had a connection to Disneyland, especially back then when it was, you know, you could just go there on a whim and it was like $25 to get in. <laughs> Very different now. But like a lot of my friends and people in the dance world worked at Disneyland. And that's kind of where, you know, we started learning how to swing dance was kind of like in that whole scene. And so then I became really into the 40s, like 30s and 40s and bought my first vintage car. And I was dressing head to toe in 40s clothes and going out swing dancing. And that was like, you know, the like nine, 1994 kind right. of. Right. Like, that you were classically trained as a ballet dancer. Is that true? I mean, kind of the word classically trained is a little bit funny because I, you know, I started taking ballet classes in West Branch, Michigan, a little ballet studio that was not much. And then in Orange County, I was, you know, in, in both there and in Orange County, I was cleaning the bathrooms in exchange for ballet classes. So I would I'm not I don't come from like a fancy ballet school and I was you know like right. I think when I did the star in the Nutcracker or something yeah I know I mean I was like a snowflake in the like little rinky dink ballet production in Orange County you know like I was that kind of dancer like struggle always struggling I always loved ballet loved dance but sometimes when I see it on paper and they say she comes from classical ballet and I was like oh Lord I'm not like you know and this I I listen to all these podcasts about the, sh the showgirls and I'm like they come from all these like famous ballet schools all over the world and I'm like oh no that's not the kind of ballet that I did you know <laughs> okay well thanks for clarifying that yeah uh, so, it's funny so I see that you started working at a strip club though when you were 19 is that yes. like your first 
job that required some sort of dancing and movement? Kind of, yeah. There's, I was doing, I was kind of like, I had so many jobs. <laughs> Worked in the lingerie store when I was 14, just tagging things. Then I was a sales girl. So I worked in lingerie and, um, then, like I was saying, I worked in the rave scene, like I was a go-go dancer. That was kind of my first like on stage thing. And then I went, wandered into a strip club with some friends and I was like, I'm going to do this too. So I was working like all these jobs at once. And for a little while I was graduated from, I was working in a department store selling lingerie and then I wanted to work in beauty. So I went into, worked in, in, at the Shiseido counter, um, while I was doing all the other, other things, working at the strip club, working in the rave scene. Cause I always kept like a legit job. Cause I was like, well, this is just all stuff that I'm doing for fun. Like the strip club and all of these things. Um, uh, at the same time I was, um, the most famous fetish model in the world, which is very like, you know, a, big fish in a little pond, right? But I was on the cover of all those magazines because I was, you know, kind of rehashing the whole Betty Page aesthetic, doing bondage photos, but doing it all in a vintage way. So I was famous all around the world for that. Are you excited to jump into 2024? I am. I've made my resolutions. And to be honest, I've never really been good at keeping them. But this year, it's going to be different because my resolutions are to save money, spend more time with friends and family and eat healthier. And with Factor, that's a no brainer. Factor's ready to eat meal delivery sets you up for success. You get chef crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. No prep, no mess, no cleanup. You can choose from over 35 meals a week, including options for keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie. They have over 55 weekly add-ons. They make it easy to kickstart your new year. And one of my biggest issues that is that I run around all day from work to errands to chauffeuring my daughter. By dinner, we are starving and exhausted. So ordering takeout becomes an expensive solution. But Factor changes all of that. Factor's two-minute meals are my savior. And when our schedule gets too hectic, Factor is flexible, so you can change up your order and reschedule your deliveries. They've thought of everything so you don't have to. Lose weight, not flavor. Simplify weight loss with ready-to-eat keto meals designed to taste great and make you feel better. Besides these incredible meals, and believe me, they are delicious, Factor now offers tons of snack options, smoothies, and cold-pressed juices, which are my favorite thing to grab when I need an energy boost. You guys are just going to love it. So head to factormeals.com slash understood50, use code Understood 50, that's five zero, don't spell out the 50, to get 50% off. That's code understood 50 at factormeals.com slash understood five zero to get 50% off. Wait, wait. So, so that's really interesting though. Like how did that come about? Um, it just I would assume that that's a hard thing to become like the number yeah. one girl in that business. I know. How, how, yeah. Well, I, it started with first, like, it's so hard because it's like the timeline is like all over the place. Mm. Um, I, you know, I'm dressing vintage. So I'd have like um, but photography students come to me and say, can I take your picture? You look amazing. And I'd be like, sure. So I'd take these pictures. And then meanwhile, I'm working in the strip club. So I'm like, oh, let's take pictures in my corsets. Let's do these pinup photos. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the first pinup website ever on the web, on the internet. When my, I remember my boyfriend at the time was like, hey, there's this thing called the World Wide Web and we should put you on it. And so I sold little postcard sets of me posing as a pinup girl. And you'd have to like send in your check and then I'd like sign your little cards and then send it out. So that was like the first ever, it was one page when you could have one page on the internet. And um, so it's like MySpace meets OnlyFans kind of. It was, yeah, yeah, but way before any of that stuff. So right. this is like very early years. And um, yeah, so I was definitely like the first pinup girl on the web, on the internet. Uh, and then I, my site so got bigger and I was one of like the first, I'd say the first like, like 10 or 20 people to have like a membership site. Like it was when all that, but was bubbling and up, up and all the like playboy girls were making these membership paywalls where you would take pictures with the other girls and we'd all like share the pictures and put them on our paywall. So I had that too. So right. I'd say I became famous because I was connected. Like I would fly to Germany and shoot for this magazine called Marquee magazine. And I do their little like fetish videos, you know, it's like wearing corsets and walking around and, you know, uh, wearing rubber, trying on rubber outfits, trying on shoes, you know, very like 
you know, non, um, you know, <laughs> just, I just became like the, 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 the famous and the modern answer to Betty Page like that by doing all these like glossy fetish magazines all over the world. They were mostly like in London and um, there was one magazine uh, in LA and Orange County areas and performing at these fetish parties. And, you know, everybody in that world knew me at that time. Do you think it's because you had your own look that was kind of more romantic than this like, you know, wickedly sexy type of girl that can be threatening? Do you know what I mean? Like you see more yeah. romantic and soft yeah, it's, I remember very well how it all st started, um, too. And I forgot about this part, but like, so I, I, I was, I was working, you know, I was working the lingerie store and I wanted to have a corset and somebody gave me an address on a piece of paper. Like, here's where you can buy a corset. And I walked in and there was this super nice guy sitting behind the counter and all these, like, you know, a rack of corsets and tons of magazines and like opera gloves and boots and all this like fetish gear everywhere. And I remember like I, I spent hours there and I was talking to this guy who became a lifelong friend um, and he showed me pictures of Betty Page. And so I'm looking at all these pictures of Betty Page and I'm looking at the modern fetish magazines and they were all like tattooed, pierced, bald girls, like really like in your face. And I was like, how come no one's doing this though? And he's like, it's wide open for you. And that's what I did. Like nobody, nobody was doing that. And so I kind of set my mind to, to do, to do that. Right. It's so interesting because it's like, it, it was coming from an earlier age and it was very raw and real who yeah. you were. And, and then it seems like it turned into something that people, there was really an opening for that kind of thing. I'm, I'm really curious because I have had a decent amount of um, women on here who are former strippers or porn stars or sort of in that in that world. Um, and they have felt very misunderstood. Their their families disowned them. You know, there was all sorts of, you know, stigma that they had to have some like sexual trauma to, to go into that field. You know, you work with so many of these women, you started in in, in that kind of environment. What what's what do you feel about that? Does your past have anything to do with it? I don't know if my experience is like having known many women who were hardcore porn stars or softcore porn stars or playboy models or act, legit actresses or like all of these things, people, I've known lots of these people and I feel like it's across the board. I mean, I feel like every woman I know has a story, like a me too-ish thing or like, oh my God, I didn't even realize it, but like I was date raped or whatever. Like, I feel like there, I do not know one woman who doesn't have some kind of story where they're like, oh, that was weird. Now I look back and I'm like, that was not cool. But I don't think that that's like the gold standard of like uh, that abuse makes you turn to sex work. I don't believe that at all. And there's nothing for me. I didn't like become a, a stripper dancer for anything reason that happened. I like, I just wanted to be about, I want to be a ballerina when I grew up and I was like, realized that my obsessions with ballet, like I have an imprint on me. I had like this, this, this uh, vinyl record from the fifties of Tchaikovsky and it had a ballerina from the fifties on it. Um, she had fishnet tights, point shoes, a, a, like a pale blue platter tutu, the dramatic makeup, the tiara, the black hair pulled back. And I was like, God, I was obsessed with that. And and I realized though, like somebody asked me once, I said, what was it that you never would do, never got to do that you wanted to do? And I was like, well, I wanted to be a ballerina, but I wasn't good enough, you know? And they right. said, oh, what well, about it that you loved? And I said, I mean, it was just like the idea of like the point shoes and the beauty and the femininity and the exaggeration, the drama and like the makeup and, you know, and he, and I'm saying all these things and, and he says, don't you feel like you got everything you asked the universe for, but in a very different way? And I was like, yeah, he goes, I never heard you say once that you just love to dance. And I was like, no, I didn't love to dance because I was not good at it. I just wanted to move and I want I love like, you know, the, 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 um, like the hands and the head and like the pointing the toes and all of these, like the, the emotion and feeling of dance. But like, I was never like, God, I feel free when I dance. So there's a lot of things in my life that I realized, like things that I saw in my childhood or experienced in my childhood that made me want, that all laid the groundwork for what I do now. Yeah. And it's and it, like a it, obsession, all of it. 
And it's interesting because the women that I have talked to, and I, I've lived in, I lived in Vegas for years. Um, you know, the women that I knew that did this, they all came from a place of feeling very powerful. They mm-hmm. did it, chose to continue to do it because it made them feel beautiful. It made them feel powerful. And yes, everyone had a story, but they, um, you know, they, they knew exactly why um, they, they felt better on stage doing that. And then they could go home to like their real life. And they, they almost loved that, that stage life, right? To them, it was the, the closest they were going to get to being a famous actress and idolized by someone, right? So yeah. um, I, I love hearing that from people. Yeah. What were you feeling? Yeah, same thing. Was your family, were they supportive of you? Um, in the grand scheme of things, Yes, but there were moments that they were questioning me and you can't blame them. Listen, I was literally 20 years old, you know, working in a strip club and like paying my own way, by the way, like I had credit cards paid, it was very self-sufficient. And, um, but my parents were, you know, maybe they challenged me a few times, like, what are you doing? And I was like, I want to do this thing like Betty Page, you know, because I'm doing all the bondage photos and stuff. And, you know, right. well, I'm sure they wanted to know how you were going to turn this into a real living. I had yeah, to- like because there was no blueprint for that. And there was no living blueprint like what Gypsy Rose Lee. It hasn't happened in 75 years that there's been a famous bondage model or um, like burlesque star. So it was very much against the odds, which I think, you know, I never had any lofty ideas of fame or that I would have a show in Vegas of this magnitude, like nothing. I never thought anything like that. I was just having a good time. And, um, it's just like, you know, I didn't, I didn't make this goal. Like I'm going to show you, I'm going to be famous, you know, but however, at the same time, you know, the, the time when my father finally accepted me, and what I was doing was, you know, I was on the cover of Playboy and like for that generation of men and that to the time I was on the cover of Playboy um, for the most, the biggest, the second biggest issue of the year, the Playmate of the Year, but after it was the Christmas issue, like Sherilyn Fenn and Sharon Stone and Drew Barrymore and all of these like women had been on the cover of Playboy. So like it was the first time my dad was like, okay. Um, so it did it was kind of weird to me that like fame legitimize me because I was kind of like well this is what I've been doing all along you know it's just like just because you didn't get it that's not right. my fault, you know <laughs> right no I understand um so how did you become go from Heather Renee Sweet like how did you pick the name Dita Avanti um I was working in the strip club and I was like I said I was just a fetish model with the name Dita and like anybody who walks into a strip club you pick like a, an alter ego it's part of the fun of it you know and also so you people don't know your name and can find out where you live or whatever yeah. so but the Vontees came from the first time I was in Playboy I was in the play in Playboy in the 90s as well um and it, they have like these book of lingerie they used to have um, that came out every other month and it was all like girls, you know, um, from all over the world. And so I was in that and mm-hmm. I said, well, I'm just Dita. And they go, no, you have to have a last name. I was like, why? Like Madonna, Cher, I want to be like a one name person. And they said, no. So I remember I was sitting at the bar and pulled out the phone book and looked under, I was like, Vons have cool things. And I was looking under the Vons and I found the name Von Treese and I called Playboy and I said, I'm going to be Dita Von Treese. And they're like, okay. And then, you know, a month and a half later or whatever, I go to the liquor store to pick up my issue and I open it up. And it says Dita Von Tees. And I was like, that's not right. And I ca- actually called them. And not even smart enough at that point to think like, this could be good, Von Tees. No, I call them and I say, hey, you guys, you got it wrong. It's Von Tees. There's an R in it. And so then they go, yeah, we'll get it right next month. And then next month it was the same. And finally I was like, whatever. So it's like a very not calculated thing. If I had to do it all again, it would probably be different. But... You know, well, it seems perfect though. I would have thought that they they changed it for you on purpose because right. they thought, oh, Von Tees, it goes yeah. with the I whole... don't think they even thought that. I don't know what they thought. Um, they didn't say so if that was deliberate, right. but I so feel like that my whole career is like that, like a series of things that were not like calculated. Like I never thought that I was there were all these things that happened that were never like my lofty goals. They were just like, oh. I mean, this is great. And like getting secretly excited, like, oh, this is, you know, like I remember being like, 
headlining a strip club in Pittsburgh, you know, at a truck stop with a billboard and being like, huh, my name, I have all the pictures to prove it to you. Like, here I am proudly standing in front of my strip club billboard in Pittsburgh, you know, or Wichita Falls. And that to me, I was like, this is my moment. This is the pinnacle of my life. This is as good as it gets. Like, and I genuinely believed it. And I was genuinely grateful for it, you know, like for everything I was doing. And, and it made it so that everything I did, whether it was, you know, doing my little feather fan dance in a beat down strip club for, you know, wh whoever, um, I didn't, I, I had, I was having fun and I feel like I don't mean to be like all universe, but it is like, I didn't ask for anything more. I just did my best and enjoyed what I was doing at the time and, and appreciated the moment, no matter how small it seems now. I was going to say, you come off as being very grateful and kind. And, you know, there are people that are total hustlers and will do anything they can to make it to the top. And it seems yeah. like every time you got to the top, you thought that was the top of the mountain, but those yeah. were just little hills and they were the mountains just getting higher and you were just on, on it for the ride. I love that. Yeah. That's such a good thing. Okay. Tell us what burlesque is. How do okay. you describe it? Okay. It's confusing to some people because burlesque is a term that's been really thrown around and capitalized on in recent years. So burlesque was a variety show that was kind of a spinoff of vaudeville. Like a vaudeville show was a variety show that happened like in the early, you know, 1900s and, and in America. And a burlesque show was kind of started in like the thirties and it was a little bit more of a racy show. And the stars of the burlesque show were strippers. And it was kind of like a and in, in, in the, the the comedy and striptease together, like you'd have like famous comedians that would come and you know, or fa before they were famous, actually, before they were like movie stars were playing burlesque houses. And it was just like more of a raucous kind of show than a vaudeville show. Like vaudeville is considered more legitimate. Um, and they say like striptease was kind of born out of like somebody doing a quick change while they were still in view of the audience and the crowd going crazy. And then the manager saying, keep doing that thing where you take off those things before you leave the stage. So it kind of turned into this show where the stars of the burlesque show were, were striptease stars. So um, there were big stars that came out of burlesque, like Gypsy Rose Lee, who, who many people know because of the musical and the film Gypsy starring Natalie Wood in 1962. And um, Lily St. Cyr, who was like another very famous striptease star more in the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, Sally Rand, who famously did the Feather Fan Dance in 1939 at the World's Fair in Chicago. Um, so there's like a few like very famous names that people may or may not know, but um, you would recognize like there was a movie called The Right Stuff that had a little bit of Sally Rand fan dancing. And so like there, if you sometimes when I say things like that, people go, oh, I get it now. I remember that. So, um, yeah, it's proves, you know, there have been like little burlesque resurgences, but it never as big as it is now. It's been it's I feel like in my my career, which started in the early nineties. Um, hey, get back cats. Um, and it, it, it's really, I've seen like, a, a major evolution just in, and not only just in like my audience, you know, my audience was mostly male in the nineties. And when I came out with my first book, um, and like around the time or just after I was on the cover of Playboy, I wrote about why I love burlesque, why I look to it, what it means to me, how I felt empowered, um, you know, in this world. And I had a whole new fan base of, of women right. and still to this day, mostly my audience is, is mostly female, um, which I feel very, again, like, so lucky for that, like, you know, I, I'm. I have this like longevity that probably wouldn't exist if I had just been beneath the hetero male gaze, you know, right. It's right. A different story, different story. And it came from me sharing my story. And I think other, other people like saying, I want, I want to do that too. I want to be like that too. I want to be in control of my sensuality. I want to liberate myself. I want to, I want to, I, I feel, I like to be inspired by a show like this, my show has always been about diversity and inclusion since I first started touring um, 15 years ago. 
-hmm. And it was kind of just like a natural thing that came from burlesque where I was like, that person is an amazing performer. And I felt like I always wanted to present performers that people can um, feel like they'll change their minds about what a burlesque show is. Like instead of having a show full of like, pinup girls. Um, how do we, how do we change people's minds about what this is? Like, you know, so that's something I did before it was a buzzword before it was cool. Um, and, and, and change people's minds about what beauty is kind of, because yeah. I, I was going to ask you about self-esteem and body image and, and the size of, of women, right. Many years ago, it was stick thin. Now it's all shapes and sizes. So how do you sort of, um, talk to the people that work with you and that are in your show about what is normal and good and looks good and how do you stay in shape? I mean, I just think, I think a lot about strength and power and ability and like, you know, although I've played with that in the past too, where I've had in my show non-dancers that just cap capture your gaze that just like capture your attention. And I really like look for that. And even in casting this Vegas show, we had these huge auditions and there were some people that I was like, can't take my eyes off that person. And maybe somebody on the choreo team was like, they're not the strongest dancer. And I was like, I'm sorry, can't take my eyes off that person. And then they, I put them in the show and guess what? I'm right. You know, 90% of the people go, couldn't take my eyes off that one person. And I was like, I know, because it isn't always about like this show offy dancing or, or circusy thing or whatever you're doing. That's like, it, it sometimes you just you can't really explain why someone draws your eye, and I'm very interested in that, and I always have been. And so, um, it's a, I feel like it's one of the things that I love about burlesque and what I do, and that I can break those rules and go against what people say. You know, you should hire, you should have this kind of person. I I, I don't agree. You know, because like also. I'm not. You know, I come from the everything I do was born out of the things that you could perceive as my downfalls or the things that are my, that I'm not good at. But if I had been good at those other things, I would not be the world's most famous burlesque star. Like I would not be doing any of this. And I feel Mm -hmm. like I picked the right path and I persevered and I didn't say, Oh, I can't, I'm not as good of a dancer as those people. So I can't dance. No, I was like, I'm going to do it my own way. And, um, I just, I'm very, I feel like I've, even when I think about the artists that I love, like whether it's someone who's a singer, um, there's always something I feel like this in this thing that draws you to them. And and sometimes it's the imperfections. Like I, I'm like, I don't like, I have a very like particular like taste in like music or singers. Like I love the way someone like, you know, Frank Sinatra communicated, right? Or I love... I love Amy Winehouse. Um, but like, I can't stand like really like vocal gymnastics type, like synthesized popish stuff. I can't, I can't listen to it. You know, <laughs> like I like be people that have a distinctive voice that is about like something more, a different kind of depth, if it makes sense. Um, you know? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, um, there's been a real push like in gyms. This is such a dumb thing to say, but like, you know, there are classes now on stripper poles. There's sort of a class everywhere about how to be more sexy and you don't necessarily have to know how to dance like that or act like that, but they teach you all sorts of things like eye contact and just being confident in your own skin can be sexy. I'm curious for people that are listening, what someone like you, who is like the epitome of sex appeal um, would say um, to give advice to someone who might not be, you know, physically, they might not feel like they're the sexiest or they might not be a great dancer. How can someone be more sexy? Right. Well, I mean, it's always about, it always starts with the, with you and how, what makes you feel sexy because the first problem people have is when they ask somebody like me, what I think is sexy. Like it's, you have to really get to the essence of what you as an individual feel and go into that. So if that for you is like, I'm going to go take that pole dancing class, you know, and and that's like where you find yourself and you're like, I feel powerful. But like some people might go to that class and be like, I was wildly uncomfortable. Like I would be wildly uncomfortable there. I would. Right. Um, 
you know, even though I've, you know, I've, I've, I've had a poll on my stage before, you know, <laughs> like, but I just am saying like, there's certain kinds of dance that I would feel like really like, doesn't feel, doesn't feel like me. It doesn't get to who, who I am, you know, like right. a, a hip hop class or something, you know, like, like there's something I just be like, Oh, my body doesn't know how to move like that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's like just noticing what it is for you and finding other, trying out different things and finding where you feel like you belong and putting yourself in that place where you might feel uncomfortable, you know, you might be like, Whoa, that, that was crazy, but I tried it. And then just, you know, maybe that wasn't for you, but, or taking a tassel twirling class with one of the amazing tassel twirlers that's in my show, you know, like I think there's fun things that you can do. And I think it's also really great to like, you know, find places where you can be around other women who are there just being, you know, playing and having fun. That's yeah. what I think is the key. I think like part of being sexy is when you are, you're having a, a good time, you're reveling in what you're doing. And like, for me, that's even the basis of every burlesque show is like, does this look fun? Is it fun? Is it playful? Is it about fantasy and spectacle, but with a lightness to it? You yeah. Know? Yeah, and I think it's interesting because so many people, I think so many women get it wrong because they think sexy is like having on the least clothes as possible or, you know, looking a little bit, you know, too too much. And sometimes that just turns people off. And at the end of the day, it's more about feeling comfortable in your own skin and liking what you're doing and having fun. And I think that, I think you're right. I mean, yeah. all the conversations I've had and also conversations with men, they are more attracted to somebody who's confident and, and feels good in what they're doing or how they're representing themselves. So. Yeah. The good men anyway. You can say there's definitely some that will be like, do not want you to find your power and confidence. You know, right. they, they're, they're always a generalization is, you know. <laughs> right. But I think in terms of feeling confident in yourself. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah totally. You right. have to always you and know that you're never going to please everyone. I always, I have a famous quote, you can be a juicy, ripe peach and there'll still be someone who doesn't like peaches. Like that goes for everything. I know that's true for what I do. And I never pretend that it's got to be, you know, globally accepted and like, and further than that, I always think if everyone likes it, it's probably pretty boring. Okay. I love that. Yeah. If you want if you weren't working in burlesque, what do you think you would be doing? Um, I probably would be, um, I always say that like a par par big part of my job, I'm an aesthetic control freak. I'm very like, I notice every detail. And I remember like uh, watching this woman that I was on a photo shoot for Vanity Fair, like sometime in the early 2000s. And I was like, oh yeah, that's the job I would do. And her job was like, overseeing an entire production like is the hair right is the makeup light right is the clothes right is that thing tied right like I see all the the details you know I would be that person I'd be you know an aesthetic control freak I don't I don't even say stylist I would be like a beyond stylist because I would I can I see the hair the makeup the clothes that everything yeah. details so I'm curious there are people that you know are certain um, person when they are their brand, but then when the cameras are off, they'll put their sweatpants on their hair in a bun, you know, they'll eat Doritos and, yeah. you know, they'll sit on the couch. Are you, um, Dita Von Tees all the time? Like we've never seen you in the magazines, like celebs. They're just like us. We never see you going to Wegmans or to Albertsons, whatever. Do you shop for yourself? Do you wear these clothes when you're shopping? Like, tell me, tell me what you are like when the cameras are on. Okay, well, I mean, first of all, Dita Von Tees does eat a cheese puff at home <laughs> and like with the orange fingers and everything, you know, like I'm, I don't see like, the thing is though, like I'm wearing my, I, I'm wearing a robe, like this is what I would be wearing, you know, <laughs> like I just, yesterday I went grocery shopping for, for the holidays and I was wearing just like a sweater and a skirt, but I put on a really nice 1940s coat. Cause like, it's not hard to put on a coat. It's cold out. So, right. And people all day were like, wow, that coat is beautiful. Wow, that's amazing. I'm like, thanks. You know, I just feel like I love putting on something, even if I throw that coat over my athleisure so I can run, go to my, you know, workout and then, you know, put a coat over it. I just, I just enjoy presenting myself like that. And it's not hard. And it's like, 
an old 1940s coat that I paid less for than a modern coat, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I just enjoy it. And it's not hard for me. I'm well-practiced in it. I don't have like an alter ego or like a secret person that I don't want people to see. Hey, do I, I, mean, I don't want people to really see me like, you know, eating the cheese puffs, you know, like sit with the fridge open, like eating the, you know, of course I'm just, okay. But like, well, it's I'm, like, I'm not like, if you can get the feeling from just talking to me, I'm not like speaking to you in a glamorous fashion <laughs> about my beautiful life. I, I really don't like that kind of thing. I'm just like, you know, I, I, I enjoy like wearing red lipstick and like yes no i get oh, it that's it's innately you i mean i get yeah, it I totally can't. but not like i because i because i've met and i've actually met like other burlesque dancers that do this like this like i am so they have like the accent and they try to be like glamour glamour and i'm like oh it's like it's just very like tiresome for me and it's not authentic and you can i can see right through when people are putting on airs as like this persona to feel, be sexy, be glamorous. And it's like, as soon as you are trying to be sexy, you have failed yeah. because you don't understand what it is. Right. Um, you spoke before about music that you um, genuinely like. A couple of those people you mentioned are dead. Do you have someone who you listen to now that's alive um, that, that we would be interested in hearing what your music taste is? Yeah. I mean, my music taste is across the board. I was, I did this thing once for Spotify. They 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 called up my agent one day, and this is like a couple few couple years ago, a few years ago. They're like, we want you to come to Can, and we're gonna listen to your to. They have this big convention called Can Lion. It's in the south of France. We want we're gonna look at we're gonna analyze your listening history and like don't try to be cool and listen to like try to change it. We already got you. We already know what you do. So I had to sit there while they analyzed my listening history and they were just like, this is outrageous, you know, because I listen to like electronic music and it reminds me of my like, you know, rave days. Um, and I listen to like Amy Winehouse, George Michael. I, I, you know, I love many kinds of music, you know, I, but I like music that I can listen to someone's album the whole way through and I don't have to skip through things. Because I can't be right. bothered to make playlists, right. but I like a lot of different music. Lately, I've been I've been listening to this Barbra Streisand audiobook, which is really great, and I've been digging into her first um, like the songs that she was singing in nightclubs before, and she never even had a singing teacher. Oh, wow. ever. And it's like really interesting to listen to her young voice when she was just starting out um, with no. Yeah formal training. So I know you were in, okay, everyone's going to freak out if I don't ask you this, because you were in one of Taylor Swift's mm -hmm. videos, Bejeweled. Um, how did that opportunity come about? And obviously you have to tell everybody what it was like to work with Taylor. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I was just sitting here one afternoon and um, I think I, my, my PR was like, oh, we, Taylor Swift's people reached out to me to ask, to try to talk to you. And so that, you know, they, her people called me and I'm talking to them They're like Taylor wants to do this thing. Taylor wants to do this thing. And then suddenly Taylor comes on and then we're talking and she knew everything about what I do. And she was very like, I love what you do. And I want to showcase what you do because I think it's so great. And, you know, cause usually like people, I'm used to people coming to me and being like, Hey, can I borrow that glass? Thanks. You know, or like, they just, you know, they just, I'm on their mood board, you know, um, but, you know, it's one of those rare times that she, and she said to me, too, she goes, I see people like mimicking you and copying you and they don't give you credit. And I was like, yeah, that's like, <laughs> <funny."> <laughs> that's like so she said, you know, I want to be side by side with you and I want to learn from you and I want you people to see what you do. And I was like, wow, cool. And it was amazing. And she's, you know, she's an amazing woman. And that was like one of the, it's one of the few times that I've been approached in that way, you know, cause it's usually just, you know, take yeah. it. <laughs> are, you, are you surprised at how big, especially this year? I mean, she's always been relatively big, but this year she has totally become one of the biggest stars, if not the right. biggest star. Um, and, you know, I don't think a lot of people would necessarily say she is like the best voice, but she's one of the best performers and her, her repertoire as a songwriter is so yeah. unbelievable. And, um, you know, I brought my daughter to her concert mm -hmm. the beginning of the year um, in Philadelphia, and my daughter is still asking to go to another concert next year. It was like the greatest day of her life. And I just, yeah. you know, yeah. I love performers like that. We don't, we don't have that anymore. Like in our generation, 
Like I listened to Michael Jackson, um, George Michael, you know, it was Madonna, Whitney Houston. Um, but it, you don't have stars like that. I don't yeah. think any Prince. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Prince. Yeah. Like I feel the same way. I was just like, Oh, there doesn't, it doesn't feel the same, but you know, then when you, when you're like every generation, talks about music in a way like, well, we had David Bowie and we had, you know, Prince and, and right. you know, I'm like, you know, the younger people just don't, they won't hear it at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, I feel like that always happens, you know, but yeah, she, I, that was a long, I'm, that was a long concert. I remember like it was, it was like four hours and I remember I was sitting there like, you know, like in their little VIP area and her people were like, you should go now. Like oh. before the show ended, I was like, but I didn't see the bejeweled part yet. And they were like, no, if you don't go, you're going to be here for like three more hours. And I was like, oh, yeah, right. Because getting out of there is like, yeah, getting out of there is like major. But yeah, yeah she's she's amazing. And she's, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm very happy for her because she is, I, you can feel her um, authenticity and kindness and she cares. You know, I, I feel like she cares about her fans and she's, yeah. She's a good, a good person and a yeah. smart person. Making that video was an incredible operation. You'll notice none of it got leaked. I mean, the song was never played on set at all. Like it was super secret. Like we'd go into this little secure tent and she'd put the headphones on me and say, this is the song. And then we oh, wow. out. Mm -hmm. it was really, um, she's an amazing director. Wow, that's so cool. Um, you were also in Don't Worry Darling, which of course became sort of, you know, tabloid fodder because Olivia Wilde was the director and she was dating Harry Styles during that. Do you have any good gossip from being on that? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to remember if I knew about it. I don't know. Um, I just remember, I, I remember one time, a long time ago, I said, like, I don't, it was like a Burberry show in London and I was sitting next to Harry Styles and I'd never heard of him before. And the next day I had all this like hate mail, like email, people, all these girls emailing about, about like, stay away from Harry and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't even know what they're talking about. And then I had to ask somebody to go, oh, it's Harry Styles. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And he was just like the lovely guy. And, um, and then I got to the makeup trailer that morning and it was like the first thing we shot after, you know, like the first, one of the first productions to start up again, um, after the COVID thing. Mm -hmm. And he like was so lovely and immediately remembered me and everything. And I was like, can you remember me? He's like, of course, but he's like a real gentleman, you know, even when I was like in the glass doing the performance, which was just crazy because it was like first thing back and I haven't performed in a long time and I'm wearing this like blonde wig because it tied in with the story and everyone's going crazy like all of the stars of the movie and it was like a really intense like intense scene um but really like a, a fun moment it's a shame there was so much like drama around the film because I don't really know why there would have been you know it doesn't yeah I mean listen at the end of the day I think it, it sent people to the theater to see where yeah, it's, the it's true it out, right so did Olivia actually direct you during that scene yeah yeah she did um yeah and it was like I just kind of did my my usual thing a few takes and then she said okay now we're doing one take where you know this thing and you're gonna lock eyes with Florence's character oh. And like, it was like very much like just me doing my thing until we did one final take, which was kind of like a, you know, uh, the kind of, it's, it's a pivotal scene in the movie. It's like a moment where she figures everything out. So right. it, was, it, was, it was me just being me, but, um, uh, you know, still an important part of the movie, even if it was short. And I'm pretty sure it's like the best Swarovski crystal has ever looked on screen. Yes, I think so. I was like, yes, that's what it's supposed to look like. Whenever they show like uh, some a pop star at the Super Bowl, like with they have a rhinestone microphone or whatever, and you're just like, that doesn't it doesn't show up at all. But that is how Swarovski crystal is supposed to look on on screen. <laughs> right. Okay, so let's talk about how people can come see you live now um, in Dita Las Vegas, a jubilant review. You're playing in Las Vegas at the Horseshoe. Yes, the horseshoe used to be values, and we're in this the the Jubilee Theater, which was this 
legendary theater. Um, the stage is half the size of a football field. It's got, it was the great showgirl theater with all of the things that come out of the floor and out of the ceiling, chandeliers that come down with showgirls on. Up. It's just like got all these bells and whistles and, um, and the Rat Pack played in there, played there as well. So it's kind of this legendary space. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I have a feather in my cap and is that I'm using all of these incredible costumes that were in that review, all the Bob Mackie vintage costumes. And it's, you know, it's millions and millions of dollars worth of feathers and rhinestones. And um, it's a big, you know, it's a, it's a little, my version of a, a the classic Las Vegas review with show girls and show guys and more feathers than any show in Las Vegas. And that's a guarantee more feathers and rhinestones than any show in Las Vegas. For wow. sure. Were you, did you have a choreographer? Or did you really have a hand in all of in all of the show? Um, we, I had a choreography team who worked with the cast, and a lot of it is like my it's like my life's work, like all of these different numbers that I've done besides the glasses. But we have all my glasses on stage at once, including the Taylor's glass. Um, oh. And so, like, like my bird, I have a bird cage act. I come out of a big powder compact. I have all these other things, like tons of like my life's work, but we have other performers doing these numbers, like for some of the lesser known acts that I've done over the years. Mm-hmm. And what um, can people expect to see? Like, tell us just a little bit more about it. I mean, is it, does everyone get naked? Does everyone, you know, for people again, who have been to something like this and are wondering what they should see when they're in Vegas. Well, they are extravagant stripscapes. So there is definitely striptease. Um, it has that, you know, that I think there's a difference between like the classic Vegas showgirl and the burlesque performer. Like the burlesque performer is a striptease star and has a little bit more like inviting you in and sensuality and eroticism. And the showgirl is a little bit like more cool. There's a, there were a lot of rules about the sh- topless showgirl. However, they were completely topless um, and in burlesque. We do the pasties with the tassels and, and whatnot. So it's kind of like combining the two together and bringing my favorite bits of both um, of both worlds together. So uh, it's definitely sexy. It's there's the biggest burlesque show in the world that ever there was. So I'm very proud of that and um, glad that we can, you know, we're the last, we're the only show where you can see that true classic Las Vegas because, you know, there's other shows in Vegas and they have their they have their feathers, but this is like, these are the, you will never see costumes like this anywhere else in the world. Right. I promise. Amazing. And it runs through uh, April, correct? Yes, I, I believe we're going to add some more dates. So okay. but right now we have dates through April. And it's just Friday and Saturday nights? Thursday, Friday, select Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then we're on New Year's Eve weekend, uh, 28 through 31. I'm not sure when this airs, but. Yeah, okay. So it'll be after that, but that's fine. Um, and then just quickly tell me, like, when you're in Vegas, how, like, what's your day in the life? Are you guys um, practicing all day long and then you go into the show? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a little bit of both. Like we do usually when I, I, I come in on Thursdays on the same day of the show. So I'm usually like doing some um, tech stuff and rehearsal things. And there's always a lot to do. Um, (laughs) And then I usually have time on like Friday and Saturday before the show to kind of like go to lunch or, you know, I drive, I drive a vintage car on stage um, during the show. So I'll usually take that car and rip around the strip every once in a while. So you can kind of see me doing that every so often. (laughs) So I'm just getting my bearings in Vegas and there's definitely things that I want to see and places I want to go, but I just um, haven't had too much time on my hands yet, but I will. Is there a show in particular that you'd love to see in Vegas? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot that I would love to see. I'm definitely going, I was, invited by you two to come see the sphere. So I would love to come and see that. That's on my list of things to do on one of my days off. And Adam Clayton from you two came to see my show and Bono is a big fan of burlesque. And I had a whole conversation with him about burlesque once. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of what I, I did see. I love seeing the magic shows. Yeah. I really want to see David Blaine do that show when he's in Yeah. yeah. Have you seen David Copperfield? No, I haven't. I'd love to. I really want to see the magic shows. Yeah. Yeah. When I lived there, my most favorite thing that I saw was Celine Dion. She was just, you mm-hmm. know, lover or hater, she was just amazing in concert. Yeah. So, and I saw Britney. 
careers there too. I saw Brittany once. That was pretty great. It was so interesting to listen to her audio book yeah. and all the stuff about Las Vegas. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Love, love Brittany. Always a fan. Um, all right. So for anyone who's listening, who finds all of this very interesting, who has had an interest in burlesque, how would you say that they can break into this? Are there classes? Is there something they should study? Is there a place they should go? Well, there is the, the Burlesque Hall of Fame is in Las Vegas, and they have my original martini glass on display there at all times. But I would say that would be a good resource to go. And there's a big event there that happens every year. Um, like a There's like a, they have like the Legends Showcase where they have some of the, uh, old time burlesque stars and then they have a competition for all the new burlesque stars and then there's also viva las vegas there's a big burlesque showcase there which happens and the big car show i think that's in april so um but yeah there's a lot of local burlesque talent as well and small and small burlesque shows to come to go see you know what the local burlesque shows are like as well i haven't been to any of them yet but i know a lot of the the performers and we have dirty martini who's a great world famous tassel twirler is in my show and so she's you know she always keeps me abreast of what's going on in the tassel twirling world <laughs> interesting and i'm just curious how does it work with you finding your talent like is it kind of like the chorus line where where people are you know applying all the time and you get to see these new interesting dancers that you're finding out of nowhere um, I mean, I look for burlesque talent that way, and I have representation of authentic burlesque performers that are, uh, I mean, in this show. Um, but I have a lot of like dancers, like that we've that we did huge auditions in LA and in Las Vegas, and cherry picked the best of. So it's like a balance of um, professional dancers and burlesque performers. Amazing. So everyone should uh, visit you when they're in Las Vegas at the Horseshoe, um, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday nights through at least April. And then where can they find you if they're interested in just following you, like your Instagram, you have a website? Yeah, I'm very active on Instagram and uh, semi-active on Facebook, um, but it's just at Dita Von Tees with the double E's in it. So yeah, find me there. And do you read your DMs if people DM you? Um sometimes that's how busy I get (laughs) we won't guarantee a response but but uh, people can find out what you're doing on it yeah yeah okay Dita thank you so much for joining us I really appreciate your time and good luck if I come to if I go to Vegas which I do often I am going to come see your show very good I hope you will thank you thanks Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.